Good afternoon, Westlaco ISD teachers. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Carolina Lopez and I have here Mrs. Julie Kelly. Uh, welcome everybody, glad you're with us today. I am your instructional technology strategist and I can't wait to get into our topic. Yes, today we will be talking about crafting relationships with students. And this happens to be a personal favorite for both of us. We know that building relationships is a key to reach our students and get them to learn all that it is we are um, expected to teach them. But we also understand that this has been a challenge during the world of virtual instruction. It, it tends to be the hot topic that comes up when we speak to teachers as a number one concern. You know, um, they say we're, we're teaching and all we see are a bunch of little blank black squares. We don't know what our students look like. We sometimes don't even know what their voice sounds like because students have resorted to using the chat feature as opposed to unmuting themselves. And then when some of our students find the courage to perhaps, um, you know, turn on their camera, we're seeing ceiling bands. So we hope today that you learn some different ways that you can get your students engaged. And uh, we, we hope that they're quick, easy to use, uh, daily in, uh, routines to launch your uh, instruction um, for your students. So looking at our course objectives, um, we're gonna be looking at ways to cognitively challenge and emotionally support students. So we'll have some activities that hopefully will encourage students to turn those screens back on so that they can participate and uh, move the screens so we see them and not the ceiling fans. And I'm hearing from the little ones, sometimes we see feet. So maybe those little ones will sit up better. Um, we'd like to help students feel connected through their relationships, through peer relationships, and engage students in meaningful relationships with adults. Uh, so those, that, those are our content objectives. Um, activities to support those goals so they will tune in. Um, we also have language objectives of you know the four domains of listening, speaking, writing, and reading. Because this is a recorded session, we obviously won't be able to um, actually do those things. But we do encourage you as you come across material you know that resonates with you, do stop the, the recording. Um, take notes, write things down, write your thoughts down. Um, and perhaps you are, do, are doing this full group, you know, same thing. Stop and pause and, and reflect so that you can internalize the material. And then um, a, a, a nod to personalized blended learning. Uh, relationships with students is an important concept of personalized blended learning. And when we talk about uh, relationships with students, we mean that teachers develop supportive relationships which respect individual and collective identities in the classroom community in a way that empowers learners. That is our big goal with personalized blended learning relationships with students. So we'll go ahead and let Catalina talk about some common English language pitfalls. Yes, and uh, Julie, I'm glad you mentioned empowering the learner because that's exactly what we want to do for our English learners. And one of the common pitfalls when we're uh, addressing our English learners in the classroom is this uh, dumbing down effect or the watering down of the content and the rigor that we expect for our English learners to uh, engage in in the classroom. And, you know, I will admit that I have fallen victim to this. Sometimes, um, you know, when we have that English learner who raises up their hand and says, you know, do I, I don't get this. And if, you know, we're, we're um, having to address so many other things in the classroom, it might just be easy to say, okay, well, you know what, um, go ahead and just don't do all 10 questions, just go ahead and work on the first three. And if you're having trouble writing, just go ahead and have your partner write. And so that's the quick and easy solution, the immediate, right, attention to the student, or at least we think, but 
that really is a disservice to the English learner. So instead, there are a lot of other things that we should be doing to help our English learners instead of lessening that rigor, because we all know that the STAR assessment does not discriminate. All students are expected to master the STAR assessment, regardless of the special population that they may find themselves in. And so we don't want to change that expectation for our students in the classroom. So if we move along to the next slide, what you will see here is um, what we can do for our English learners. We can share high expectations and high hopes for learning. We can communicate confidence in their ability. So if I encourage the student to write, then I'm letting them know that I think they have what it takes, or that I know they have what it takes. It may not be perfect, but that they can do it. We need to help students develop that growth mindset. If we're constantly coming to the rescue and shortening the task or lessening the load, then how are they ever going to see growth? How are they ever able to um, be uh, expand on their skill set? And then we have to also connect their effort with success. We know that you know they may not find success all of the time, but it, their, their efforts are worthy of, of receiving some affirmations. And some ways that we could do this is by having them track their effort or progress over time. We've talked in the past about, you know, tracking sheets where students are allowed to, you know, graph their progress and then, of course, reflect on how they have grown. So making the focal point for our English learners be that growth component. And then, of course, personalized learning, showing respect for the student voices by asking about student interests. If we know we want an English learner to be a fluent reader, why not ask that English learner what they enjoy reading? Because if they have that innate interest in the topic, then chances are they're going to perform better, they're going to be willing to participate. So let's allow their voice to be heard and allow them to help us make some of those decisions as well. And just create those opportunities for student choice. There, uh, there's a million ways that we can do that. You know, speaking as an English language arts teacher, if we were gonna read a novel, I'd you know do a commercial on, on three, four novels, and then I'd have the class vote. Which one would you like to read? And of course it came from the students, not it wasn't Carolina Lopez choosing the book, it was the students choosing the book. So now they were they were in, invested and they wanted to, to follow suit. Another common pitfall um, that we see uh, with English language learners um, is the whole group only approach. We have got so much learning to do I need to keep everybody together so everybody hears the same thing. Um, and that can be a pitfall because you may have some learners, uh, variances in what they already know. They may not need to uh, hear some of the material again or read some of the material or the content um, because of their um, their leveling. You know, they, they may not need it and they could be moving using that time uh, for further learning in other areas. So. The whole group only approach really does not meet the needs of all your learners. It really meets the needs of your middle group of students. And so, you know, you see in this example, can we work with a partner? And, you know, the teacher is saying, we don't have time for that. I didn't plan for that. Um, we should be planning for that so that we can meet the needs of, of all the different um, levels that are in a classroom. And so um, one of the things we can do, and you know, remember the kids wanted to work in small groups and the teacher's like, no, we need to stay together. But it is important for our EL learners uh, to have these peer relationships. So one of the ways, you know, to help encourage that is as a teacher, we need to see our students as individuals or, or clusters of abilities and then plan accordingly for those different abilities. Um, we also really need to do a good job of knowing our students and honoring, you know, where they come from. Let's pronounce those names correctly. And if we do err in pronunciation, own it, honor it, teach them how to, to correct properly. Um, show awareness of their academic abilities 
by individualized lessons as needed. It doesn't mean every single assignment for every single kid is individualized. It means because of this TEAK, I'm going to make sure the kids get the different levels that they need. And definitely take time to celebrate student success. We need to show, you know, we need to recognize the growth so that the, the learning can continue. Um, it's very important to show them that you care. Don't just tell them. Uh, demonstrate empathy. Demonstrate warmth. And as you project that onto your kids, it will develop a collective identity of your classroom that as a class, we care for each other. And then engage in same level uh, conversations. And so the idea under that is to interact with students, encouraging them to share ideas and not just recall information. And a, a big part of today's presentation is, is covering this, is um, having a ways to um, have students share ideas. So we're, we're gonna be getting to that soon. And so not only is it important to allow these peer relationships, but as Julie was mentioning, also for the teacher to, to show some warmth. Another common EL pitfall that we see is the all business approach. And it's not intentional, but you know, teachers have a lot on their mind. There's a lot of things they have to do. They have deadlines that they have to meet. They have parents, they need to return phone calls. They need to answer emails. And so we as teachers need to remain present for our students. And by that, I mean, if we've got a student who, you know, is showing some kindness, some warmth, just, you know, perhaps giving us a little gift, then, you know, instead of, thank you, um, I'll take care of that. Did you do your homework? Just really taking the time to, to talk to the student and, and have a, a conversation that is not necessarily academic, but can be social because we, you know, social language is also very much a part of what we need to do. And so some of the ways that we can stay away from the all business approach is by providing students uh, regular feedback, giving them the feedback, having them receive that feedback and empowering them to again, exercise their agency. And we can do this by having them set academic goals, have them track and reflect on their progress. And this is what our conversations can, with them can be as opposed to just strictly, you know, did you do your homework or, you know, why were you late for class? And then of course, also helping students make those informed and important decisions about the learning process, including uh, the selection of learning activities and how and why, uh, when they demonstrate mastery. So. As, as a teacher of an English learner, it's okay to, to have that soft side and it's okay to, to be empathetic as uh, Julie Kelly mentioned. You know, our students, they need that, they crave that, especially in the world of, of virtual instruction. So we can provide that for them and uh, create opportunities where, you know, we can have those conversations, then perhaps we'll get them to turn, to log in get them to turn on their camera and actually have it face them. So we're gonna look into some specifics um, in a bit. So one of the things uh, that we have mentioned is the importance of peer interactions, the social language. And so we would just like to remind, you know, there is a teak, you know, for social language and you know, we have it highlighted here is social language proficiency in English consists of the English needed for daily social interactions. So perhaps if you're like, I don't have time to do that, I need to get to the content, then go ahead and put it in your lesson plans. Put it down specifically, social interactions, and here's your teak. And now it's a priority because, you know, you've put it in your lesson plans. It is not wasted time. It is vital time. It's social language. It's peer relationships. It's building that community. So let's look at some social language interactions that you could have in your virtual world.
So what you see here is a sample icebreaker that we could use in the classroom. Now, I did not come up with this myself. I actually uh, got this idea from a middle school teacher when I asked her early on, you know, how's attendance? What is it like? And, you know, she mentioned it's a struggle. It's hard, you know, to get them to log on. And so I resorted to dedicating maybe two or three minutes of non-academic time at the beginning of my, my lessons and sometimes at the end. She says, I kind of like to throw them off so they don't know when it's going to come up. And, and I'll do just random little polls in my classroom. And so when I asked her to elaborate, she said, for example, you know, I'll show them nine squares and it might be nine squares of little Debbie snacks and they'll be numbered. And so I'll ask the students to go ahead and type in the chat or take a poll on which is their favorite little Debbie snack. She says, now I know that this has nothing to do with what my lesson is going to be about, but I got them on. I've got them logged on. And, you know, sometimes um, they're, they're there. It helps with even the tardiness. They're there on time because if I do it at the beginning of class, then they know they want to be there to see what their friends have written in the chat. Or she says, if I put it toward the end, I know they're going to stay until the end because they're just curious to see what their peers are going to select. And you, I mean, this could you could put so many different options. It could be, you know, who's your favorite, you know, teen celebrity or, you know, name titles of songs or or titles of movies or favorite colors or favorite ice cream desserts. I mean, there's a million different um, options that you could have for your students. And all it takes is just one screen one slide before you get into the actual academic instruction. But, you know, don't feel like it's not a part of your lesson. The way um, Julie mentioned, you know, we have that English language proficiency standard that we can connect it to, and we are obligated to provide those opportunities for our English learners to have these conversations. So it may not be directly related to the geometry angles you're teaching or the life cycle of a butterfly, but anything that'll capture your students' interest and get them engaged, that's what we want to see happening in the classroom. Plus, it's also a great way of getting to know your students and building relationships with them. Um, I was just going to add on this. I've seen this where the teacher tells the students, you know, pick your favorite number. And then on, on the countdown of one, two, three, then everybody drops their number in the chat. So the chat just gets bombed. <laughs> and that's, you know, that just adds a little bit of fun and intrigue, too, when everybody's doing it at the same time, almost like a little race. Okay, uh, another way uh, to start your, your day off with a social interaction is to invite everybody to change their background um, and break the ice with a fun virtual background as your conversation starter and talk with each other. Hey, I love that background. And, uh, who, what kind of tree is that? Or where do you suppose that person is at? Or how would you feel being in, in um, Sally's environment? You know, there's just so many different ways that you could have social interactions just by encouraging the students to change their background. And it doesn't hurt and it doesn't affect, you know, the academics, but it certainly gets them engaged to come see who's got which background. And sometimes there's pride in our background and we can't wait to show it off as well so you know that's a little that you know showing some warmth and uh, caring and empathy we have a link here down at the bottom for virtual backgrounds and how to change your background uh the first link is directions on how to do that in zoom and the second link is how to do that in google meet and we have you know this at the uh, end of this um presentation as well so there's there's ways to, uh, to, to make your changes. And I just wanted to add that, you know, you could tie it into instruction. If I am a science teacher and I'm teaching about, you know, Antarctica and I want to have some penguins in the background, well, then that might just be my, my uh, attention getter, my grab, my focus for that day, and then have students anticipate what it is that they're going to learn. So um, there's definitely also an opportunity to tie in that instructional component uh, as far as the teacher is concerned when, with their background. But then also, you know, it could be a review. It could be a review for the students. If you ask the students, you know, I want you to go and find a background that best uh, connects or that connects to what we learned today and then allow students an opportunity to unmute themselves and share why or how that background connects to um, what was learned for that day. 
Oh my goodness. Like and then it could be followed up with a writing activity, looking at the person's background and, you know, sharing everything they know about that topic in that background. It's yeah. The power of something so simple. Right. And so this is another cute one that I actually got from our secondary ELAR strategist, Mrs. Elida Ramirez. She, uh, I walked by her office one day and she had this baby Yoda uh, on her desk. And I said, what is that? And she just kind of chuckled and she said, it's my engagement piece. And I said, tell me more. And so they were having a PLC that day. And she said, you know, I've been reading up on different ways to just kind of get students engaged when we're teaching um, with students. Um, online remotely and uh, something as simple as having an object that would spark some curiosity in your background for students to ask questions about um, I think that would be really neat I think students would have fun um, trying to figure out why it's there and then um, then you won't have to worry about them not engaging in terms of not typing in the chat or not unmuting themselves because your super eager students are going to be you know very restless and want to know why that you know that image that image or that object is is in your screen so include an interesting piece of realia in your background to launch those conversations and then the uh, the final social interaction um, sample that we have today is start class with a scavenger hunt there's lots of uh, samples like this um, available on the web where you know it's it's you know the old-fashioned where's waldo and you've got the objects down below and see who can find them and if you maybe put this on jamboard and have the kids uh, use their sticky notes and you know uh the sticky note feature on top of when an object has been found they can write their name on who found it you know first so uh, a scavenger hunt is just fun and then you can also do a physical scavenger hunt you know, I've heard of a lot of the lower grade teachers telling the students, okay, I want you to run around your house and find these certain objects and come back real quick. Um, you know, so it can be a, a, an image scavenger hunt or the actual physical scavenger hunt, but um, just things to get the kids engaged. And then, of course, we're going to go into some... Uh, sample templates of Jamboards that you can use to build um, your relationships with students and that just build in that SEL component. And what you have here on the screen is this beautiful logo that um, a team of people have, have put together within our district uh, to just let students know that we care because we care and, and how it's important for all of us as teachers to have elements of SEL uh, embedded in all of the lessons that we do. So let's go into some of those um, templates. And as you see here, there are um, several of them that are on Jamboard. And there's an act of kindness, there's empathy shoes, love your selfie, a gratitude jar, and checking in. And really what they are is just different um, templates that teachers can use. And students will, like on the act of kindness, students can you know add a post-it of an act of kindness that they have done and so then they can see what other, what their other peers have done you know that week or that day and then of course the empathy shoes this is where um you have students put themselves in the place of another person and then just really um kind of take that in and, and describe how does that person probably feel if you had to tell them something what would you say and then the selfie is, of course, you know, almost like the, the a version of the love letter to yourself that we've talked about before, where the students um, have a picture of themselves and then they 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 write what is it that they like about themselves. The checking in, I like this one. This one's great because, as a teacher, you know, if you've ever had some of those students that. You know, you just kind of have to read their body language. You don't know, um, are they having a good day? Are they having a bad day? So that you know what approach to take with them. This checking in chart allows the student to indicate: Are they doing great? Are they just doing okay? Or is today just not a good day for them? And so then, as a teacher, you know what your approach is going to be with that student. So I've seen teachers actually do this on a bulletin board, 
But I really like the idea of just having it on on a jam board and having students, you know, um, put a post it and put where they where exactly they fall in there. And then, of course, a gratitude jar. And so what the gratitude jar is, is where students give thanks. They give thanks to someone. And so they they grab a post-it and they put it in the jar and it's it's their um, gratitude uh, note to someone for that week. And so um, this actually is a really uh, neat idea because um, as adults, I know that we've committed to, to writing some gratitude letters and it's amazing the impact the power that a simple thank you, you know, I was thinking about you today, how far that really goes with, you know, people returning back and saying, you know, I just needed to hear that. And so we never know the burdens that people carry. And so this is just a nice um, habit to have in, in our classroom to create this climate and culture there. And so you have a link to each of these templates there for you to make your own copy and use in your classroom. On the next slide, we have additional templates and uh, we've got the marshmallow wellness. And so the students uh, write a little note on the marshmallow and they add it to their drink. And you know what the note says is going to be completely up to the direction from the teacher, or even just a reflection. What went well? You know, we participated in this activity. What do you think worked well? I like this one, the roller coaster check-in. I guess because I like roller coasters, but you know, it really shows the highs and the lows for students. It's kind of like the check-in chart, and so it's just a jam board with the roller coaster, and the student puts a sticky note, a post-it um, that indicates how they feel. So if they're on a high and they're doing really well and today's just been a really an awesome day, they would put it there. And if not, you know, they can put it lower. And so there's different ways to go about this. I mean, you could do this individually, but you know, it doesn't have to be individual. It could be collaborative as well. And so um, there's different ways to structure it. Another one I really like, and I think you know, it's cute for elementary, but I know secondary students still have worry. It's called a worry monster. So this one might be one that you want to do privately, but what students do is they feed their worries to the monster. So whatever is on their mind and whatever is bothering them, they can jot it down and feed it to the monster. And that also is a way of checking in with our students and ensuring that their, their mental health is is where it needs to be to, to be successful in the learning environment. And I say this because often as adults, I mean, think about, you know, when something is bothering us and we need to get it off our chest or we just need to tell someone or we just got to write it down and collect ourselves before we move on to the task at hand. And so this might actually be something that the teacher could share out to that student who maybe put their post-it note on a really low part of the roller coaster. And then of course, the three good things where students have to highlight three good things that are going on in their life at this time. And so that's again, that re reflection piece. Uh, the link at the top where it says SEL templates, that'll take you to the drive that has all of the different Jamboards. Plus it includes a Google doc with the directions on how to use each, each Jamboard. And then here's a collection of more Jamboard templates uh, to help you build relationships with students. And so when you click on this link, 10 Jamboard templates, here's the different types of Jamboard uh, peer student teacher yeah, interactions, you know, that are found in this with the 10 links. And then I'd also like to point out over here that Slides Mania has a really cute jams and slides template ready to go. Um, with uh, jams similar to the, the decorations that you see on here with different um, jams ready to go, such as ProCon and uh, several others. So that's off of Slides Mania. So just there's so much out there. And then this section talks about jamming with Jamboard, some tech tips. So if you are unfamiliar with Jamboard, uh, here's a link to a, I think it's about 14 minute long video uh, created by Eric Kurtz. Um, and it was recorded in October of 2020 on how to use Jamboard. And then just some other tips uh, related to Jamboard here. Um, the downside of Jamboard is everybody has access to it. Um, 
you know, so some students can erase other students' um, work. And so that's a great opportunity for some digital citizenship lessons and how we honor everybody's thoughts. We don't erase. Um, but version history is coming soon to Jamboard. So if you need to revert back to a previous version, uh, it, in the next few months, it should be available so that you can return to the original. Um, like I said, you know, to, um, the Jamboard, you may need to teach some digital citizenship and honor the work of each other. Um, the teacher does have access at any time to change the sharing permissions so that um, from editor to viewer, and depending on if you use the share button or the link option, you can make certain students have editor rights and other students don't. So, you know, you can tangle with that a little bit. Um, another recommendation I've seen when you are about to introduce a Jamboard lesson with the students, introduce it to students in a view only so that they have to continue listening to you uh, provide the uh, information that you want. And then when you are done and you've explained, change your permissions uh, to edit so then the kids can get in there and manipulate. Um, another tip is if, it, if it's a template you're going to use over and over, have one master copy. And then when you're about to use it in a lesson, make a copy of that. So the copied version is what gets used for that lesson. And you maintain your, your template for future use. Um, if you use uh, Jamboard through the web uh, version, uh, it does allow you to set a background image so that it's not just plain white. You can bring some images in. Um, if you need to get to Jamboard quickly up in the uh, URL box, which is called the Omnibox, just type jam.new and it'll take you straight to a blank Jamboard. Save you time in the classroom. Uh, let's see. Canva. Uh, has free teacher educator accounts. And so that's a great place to go create some beautiful jams uh, for your, you and your students. You can add GIFs to your jam boards. Um, how many slides can you have in a jam board? Well, they're called frames, and you can have a jam with up to 20 frames. So if you've got more than 20 kids, you either want to do something more of a peer or have multiple jams but it's 20 frames per jam. And then uh, the app version, if you're using a tablet or an iPad, uh, it does allow you the opportunity to insert content from your drive uh, into your, into your uh, jam, uh, add stickers, and there's the option for assistive drawing tools. Um, so there's just a lot with Jamboard and it continues to get better and better, you know, as, um, they get feedback from educators. And so uh, Jamboard is a great way to develop those relationships with students. And then another tip uh, I just would like to emphasize is remember Google Classroom, you have the opportunity to differentiate by who you send um, tasks to. So you could send a jam to the whole class. If you're concerned about a small group of students, you can send a jam with an interactive uh, to a small group, or if you have a student who really you just feel needs your love and you want to reach out to that student, um, perhaps you have a special jam, you know, where you want them to interact and, you know, check in with you, use a jam and send it specifically to a student, you know, so that you're building that relationship with either the whole class, targeted small group, or specifically to a student. So we want to close today with some final thoughts. And the first one is just be reflective. What can we do to make lessons more engaging, interesting, and meaningful? And so we've provided a lot of ways for you to do that today. And how much time are you allowing to help build relationships with students and allow students to build relationships with peers? And I understand that time constraints will always be there, whether it's online or whether it's face-to-face. We're always, time is always the resource we never have enough of. But if we think about the value and the impact, the return of investment, then we know that 
what we are um, spending, whether it be one minute or two minutes, is going to be well worth our time if our students are going to be engaged and we get to build that relationship with them. We also need to prioritize student needs. What are the student achievement benefits of allowing space for students to network, converse, and build relationships with each other? Think about the English learner who may not have an opportunity to speak to a peer um, who speaks uh, English or to another individual at home who speaks English. So why not provide that space for them during our instruction? So we, we wanted to end to, to make sure that we brought those questions to light because uh, although this sounds fun and, and engaging, at the end of the day, we think, oh, we've got that curriculum map and there's just so much to cover and we've got that CBA and I just don't know how. But we challenge you to give it a chance, try it out and, and send us some feedback and let us know, you know, what, what worked, what are some comments from students. I guarantee that these students, they will have, they will react, they will leave a comment and they will enjoy it. Definitely, I would love to get feedback. Back, um, and here's some of your success stories as well as some of your challenges so that perhaps we could partner and, and help get through the challenges as well. So in closing, uh, a word from Dr. James Comer, no significant learning occurs without a significant relationship. And as we know, we have got significant learning gaps. There's learning loss. So let's develop significant relationships and get through it together. And so we currently have 4,328 beautiful English language learners uh, in our district, English learners, um, who are waiting for us. Let's get out there and build connections with them. And then here's the link to our sources. Hey, everybody, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll, we're here for you. Please let us know if you need anything. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.